And what's up, Facebook? Prophet David Taylor here with your weekly prophetic word. Uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll dive right into today's prophetic word because it's already blessing my soul, so I can't wait to share it with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you, Lord, just thanking you, Lord, just humble as I know how, just grateful to your God for your kindness and for your attentive, attentiveness and for your mercy, for your grace and for your gaze and your eyes and your ears, oh God, and just hearing and having access to your presence because of Jesus Christ. So, Father, we just give you glory for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood. We stand justified before you, God, because of him, because of the blood of Christ, Lord, and not by works of righteousness that we have done. So I just give you all the glory, Lord, all that I know how, I give you the glory. So I ask you to fill me with your spirit, O oh God, to speak through my mouth, fill my eyes, my hands, my gestures, my lips, my mouth, my brain, my tongue, O oh God, that your message might be preached, taught, and prophesied today, O oh God, that you might get the glory in all things, that you might be glorified and that the saints would be edified and the demons would be terrified, O oh God, because we're going to... We want you to use us to tear up the devil's kingdom, O oh God, to turn back the powers of darkness and snatch many souls from hell, many souls from the grasp of the enemy, O oh God, and save much people alive. And I thank you for it, and I believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen and amen. So, let's jump right in. <clears throat> Today's prophetic word is entitled, New Land. New Land. Land, okay, and I'm going to read the scripture to you. Um, I'm thinking maybe I should read you. Okay, now I'll just read you this one verse because of what I want to focus on. You know. So we're reading out of 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 10. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 10. Now 2 Samuel is in the Old Testament. Samuel, the man Samuel, who is the central figure of the books, was the last uh, prophet over the nation of Israel before they switched to a monarchy. God had established a system of prophets and judges to prophesy to Israel and to judge Israel, but Israel asked God for a king, and so they wanted to switch to a monarchy. So Samuel, the Old Testament prophet, is the last of the prophets that presided over Israel as a national prophet to lead and guide Israel and intercede for them and, and bring their thoughts and concerns and prayers to the Lord in intercession and bring them back the prophetic word and say, what well, thus saith the Lord. Samuel was the last man to do that before they switched to the monarchy and the first king, which was King Saul. Okay? So he's an Old Testament prophet. And this is the second book where he's a central figure, Second Samuel. So we're looking at Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 10. Uh, Berean study Bible versions, and I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in a place of their own and be disturbed no more. No longer will the sons of wickedness oppress them as they did at the beginning. King James Version, moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. New Living Translation, and I will provide a homeland for my people Israel, planting them in a secure place where they will never be disturbed. Evil nations won't oppress them as they've done in the past. English Standard Version, and I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. Okay? So today's prophetic word is new land. And what the Spirit of God wants me to tell you, those of you that are listening to me live and those of you that are watching this on the replay, is that you are in a season of life now where God is going to move you to a new place. But this place is going to be distinctive. This place is going to be different from all the other places you've been in your life. And you may ask, how so? That this new place is going to be a place that God provides. Because every translation says, God says, and I will provide a place for my people Israel. But then God says, and will plant them. And will plant them. Okay? And that Hebrew word there means to strike in, to fix, or to plant. 
to strike in, to fix, or to plan, okay? So sometimes we move to places, and they are transitory. Sometimes we move, move to places, and we know we're not going to be there very long. Sometimes we move to places, but we don't get a, a chance to, or we don't get a leading to put down roots. Have you ever been in a place like that, where you knew that this right here, whatever it is, it's temporary? Because I met some people like that, man. I've been in some churches like that where I talked with certain people, and it only took five minutes of conversation, and I knew that relationship was going to be temporary. I'm like, okay, well, this ain't a place of roots, okay? And so what God is saying is, is that this time, God is going to strike you in. God is going to fix you. God is going to plant you. Now, that is something that only God can do. Because as the scripture says, the Lord says, he's the one that opens and no man shuts. And he's the one that shuts and no man opens. The Lord says that promotion doesn't come from the east or the west or the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and sets up another. So what the Lord is saying, what's different about this season in your life that's coming up is that God is actually going to plant you somewhere. He's going to fix you somewhere. Now, I want to show you a corresponding scripture. And you'll see what I'm talking about once I show you this scripture. Uh, it's Revelation 3.12. In Revelation 3.12, out of the King James, it says, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. Okay? Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. A pillar is a support structure. It's one of those long columns that you see that holds up the building. I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. That means that the Lord is going to permanently, permanently make you a part of the temple of God. Okay, so that's a corresponding scripture to 2 Samuel 7.10 when God said he's going to plant you, okay, in this place. That's what's different about where you're going. So why is that significant? What's the practical reality of that? That means that when God moves you to this new place, get ready to put down roots. Because some, <laughs> some of us have been running a long time and some of us have been moving a long time. Some of y'all listen to me right now. The scenes of your life have been scattered. The scenes of your life have been, you know, uh, uh, disparaging or, or disparity in terms of there are different kinds of scenes. Like one minute you're here and another minute you're there. Or you lived here for a while or you lived there for a while. Or you went to this church for a while or whatever. And so when you look at the scenes of your life, they've been many different kinds of scenes, almost like a kaleidoscope. Almost like, you know, shifting images. But God is saying that this thing coming up, this thing coming up new in your life, is God is going to actually plant you. He's going to plant you somewhere. So what that means is that, first of all, we have to accept that and adjust that and believe God in our minds. Because remember, I always teach you that our job is the HBO, to hear, believe, and obey God. So the first thing you've got to do is you've got to get your mind right. OK, so if God says this, this move is going to be different, that this move is going to be a move that has roots, you're going to be fixed in somewhere. You're going to be planted somewhere. For many of us, that's the first time in your life or the first time in a long time, because some of y'all have been traveling, traveling. Some of y'all have been trying to go home since you were five years old. Some of y'all have lived in a house, but you've never lived in a home. Some of y'all have had relatives, but you ain't never had a family. Okay? Some of y'all have gone to the church house, but you've never had a church home. And what the Holy Spirit is saying is that this next move of God in your life is going to actually plant you somewhere. So what that means is that you've got to get that in your head. And what do I mean by that? I mean that if you try to go into a new situation with an old script, let me show you that scripture too. There's a scripture that the Lord talks about. You can't pour new wine into old wine bottles or old wineskins. That scripture is uh, Mark 2.22. But let me look it up where I can see a bunch of translations. So Mark 2.22 
Uh, reading out of the NIV, the Lord says, And no one pours new wine into old wine skin, wine skins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins. This is why I told you, this is why Jesus teaches so much in parables. Because parables can hold up over time. And parables can hold up over culture. And metaphors and similes and allegories can hold up regardless of context. So the Lord says, nobody pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the, burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. A wineskin is a first century bottle. A wineskin is just what they constructed to keep the wine in. The Lord is saying, if you've got an old wineskin, and you've got some new wine, you're not going to take your new wine and pour it in that old bottle, because what's going to happen is that old wineskin is going to burst, and then it and the new wine is going to be ruined. The Lord said, no, you pour new wine into new wineskins. That's what God is saying to us about this next move in our lives. That he's going to actually take us to a new land, but he can't pour that new wine into an old head. He can't pour that new wine into old thoughts. So if you are used to moving a lot, like if you're one of those people that move every two years, or you used to, like I said, you've never had a family or a home or a church or you never had any of that. You have to throw that out. You got to leave that behind because now God is transplanting you to a place where you're actually going to be able to put some roots down. Where you're going to have a place that's carved out for, out for you. Okay. And for a lot of us, that's new. A lot of us have lived lives in transition. Okay. Some of y'all looking at me, you're divorced. Some of y'all got married to somebody and you tried to build a family with somebody else and it didn't work out. Then you had to go back and start over. Some of y'all may not have been married, but you've been in relationships and it didn't work out. Then you had to go back and start over. What if you could finally find a relationship that you can plant yourself in? That you can say, this is it. I don't have to look no more. Okay? So moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and one version says, move no more. And other versions say, be disturbed no more. Okay? So that they may dwell. That word means to settle down. That phrase means to settle down, abide, or dwell. In a place of their own means uh, the bottom below or in lieu of. In other words, what that means is that it's the bottom line. It's the, the last word on the subject. It's yours, and you're going to sink into it, okay? You're going to sink into it. You're going to be able to, in your life, where you can sink into it, where you can make allegiance with it, to where you can um, put down roots underneath the surface, because there's a lot of living. Oh, Lord, okay. Yeah, I rebuke that bad network connection in the name of Jesus. I command my internet to work. So there's a lot of living that we do that we call surface living. And surface living is where you just have these superficial things going on in your life. Like you work a job, but you, okay, one more time. You work a job, but you haven't yet moved into your purpose. Or you've been dating around, but you haven't really found someone that you actually want to commit to and actually build a family with. Or you've been moving to, moving to and from different living spaces, but you never really found that space. Because, you know, when you have a living space that's actually all yours, and you decorate it and you make it look like you, don't you know that every time you walk into a space like that, it speaks to you? Did you know that? When you walk into a house that's decorated properly, that looks like you, and has your little touches and your little knickknacks, and the smells you like to smell, however you like to scent your air if you do that, or however you like to rearrange your kitchen, or however you like to stack your towels, whatever kind of artwork you like. Whenever you walk into an environment that's been customized to, to be yours, it speaks to you. Did you know that? It speaks peace to your soul, if you didn't know that. It speaks peace to your soul. It's the most amazing thing. And some of us have been running, running, running since we were little kids. Some of us have been running, 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 fighting, 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 fighting your whole life as far back as you can remember. All you remember about life is fighting. Well, God said he's going to move you to a place where you can actually get beneath the surface 
it won't be shallow. It won't be superficial. So he's, he said, he's going to provide a place and he's going to plant you so that you can dwell beneath the surface. You can put down roots below the surface. It's actually going to be a place that you can nestle in and settle in and get rooted and become a pillar. Then he says, and, and not be disturbed again and be disturbed no more. And nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously, nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly. Okay, for you to really prosper and for you to really flourish in life, you can't be around wicked people. You may, you may go through a time and a season where you're around wicked people. You may have a temporary job situation or a temporary family situation when you're around wicked people. But I want you to notice that when the Lord walked to earth, who did he surround himself with? He surrounded himself with people that believed him and, and his 12 followers, people that were close to him and people that would do what he asked them to do. The Lord had to deal with wicked people, but he didn't surround himself with wicked people. Those were not his intimate companions. Those weren't the people he spent most of his time with. The Lord had to deal with field attacks all the time where the scribes and the leaders and the Pharisees and the Sadducees would come up, would come up to Jesus and would challenge him on a matter of the law. They would challenge him on something. But that was not his daily vibe or flow or situation where he surrounded himself by wicked people. And when the Lord came to a city where there was unbelief, he, he moved on to the next city. Because for faith to work, you actually have to be in an, in an environment of faith. And I don't know if you know that. Some people are, are talking about you know why stuff isn't working. If there is unbelief present, there were, there won't, it will hinder the flow. For the Lord to flow the way he wants to flow, there must be an atmosphere created, an atmosphere of expectation, an atmosphere of belief, an atmosphere of faith where people are releasing their faith for God to really flow the way you want him to flow. You can't do none of what I just said around wicked people. It's not possible. Wicked people are always trying to stick needles in your soul. They're always trying to stick little, little sores, little jabs. They're always trying to stick unbelief in your ear. And tell you about how you can't do something because, because you don't have enough education or you don't have enough money or you don't look good enough or you're too young or you're too old or you're too fat or you're too skinny or you're too short or you're too tall. That's wickedness. That's wickedness always counting up your deficits. And um, uh, uh, one of the apostles at my church preached this morning about the five loaves and the two barley fishes and about how when you put something in God's face, God's going to ask you, what do you have in your hand? And you have to bring God whatever you have, no matter how large or small or imperfect you might think it, it might be. And when you bring it to the Lord, the Lord can take it and multiply it and turn whatever it is that you give him into enough food to feed thousands of people. Okay. Well, I stopped by to tell you that can't ever happen in an atmosphere of unbelief. That can't ever happen about wicked people because wicked people are carnal, they're worldly, and they walk by sight. And what that means is that they think that what their senses tell them is all there is in the mix. And if you are a spiritual person and you, if you're prophetic, you can hear in the spirit and you can see in the spirit. And there is always more going on in the spirit than you can see in the natural because these eyes are for navigating this natural world and for enjoying the color spectrum that God gave us. But the eye of the spirit, the ear of the spirit, your spiritual ear is tuned into the invisible world, the kingdom of God. And there's always more happening in the invisible world than there is in the natural. Okay? And so you can't be around people that are carnal and worldly and ungodly and just functioning off of their senses. Now, if you don't understand what I mean by the word carnal, in the Bible, that word is carne. Spanish word for meat. It's where we get meat. It means meat or fleshly. It doesn't just mean, when it says fleshly, it doesn't really mean your body. What it means is that the way of thinking that is not of the spirit, the way of thinking that's natural apart from God, the way of thinking that's sensory, that's sense-based, that's based on your senses, and that's all that you're functioning off of. That's what it means to be carnal. It means to be fleshly. It means to be operating according to eyes, uh, nose, ears, taste, touch, 
And that's all that you think that there is. Your sensory input. And you cannot follow God like that. That's not possible. You cannot follow God by sight. You cannot follow God based on your senses because the Lord is always going to call you to do some stuff that don't make no sense to your natural mind. And the Lord is always going to call you to do some stuff that don't make no sense out here. When you look at it, you just, you'd have to shake your head because it doesn't make any sense. Because God is calling you to walk by faith. God is calling you to put your faith in his word. God is calling you to do what he tells you to do. God is calling you to believe what he says is true, regardless of any type of carnal or sensory information to the contrary. That's how we get healed. We stand on the word of God and we believe that when Jesus was beaten, when Jesus was whipped, when Jesus got the stripes in his body and the stripes on his back, it was those stripes that was taking the punishment for my sin and my sickness. So by his stripes, I am healed. In other words, the Lord was already punished for my sins and the Lord already took sickness in his body and paid for it. Therefore, I don't have to accept sickness. There doesn't have to be any sickness registered on my account because Jesus already took the punishment and Jesus already made the payment. So that's what is meant when we quote the scripture, by his stripes, I am healed. Well, if you're going to walk in that, man, you got to walk in that by faith. That don't have nothing to do with your senses. That has everything to do with your inner man and your spirit believing the word of God and pulling the healing that's available to you from Christ, from the invisible to the visible, into your life, into your body, into your mind by faith. And God does not just want to heal your body. God wants to heal your mind, your soul, your emotions, your finances, your relationships for healing. Okay? So, so that's a long way to go for me to say you can't do any of that around wicked people. You can't do any of that around carnal people. You can't do any of that around people that are just depending on their senses. It will not happen. Okay? So to review, our base scripture today was 2 Samuel 7.10, where God says, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. So God is going to provide a place. He will provide, not us. He will provide a place. That means it's been prepared for you. A place prepared for his people by God. He's going to plant you. He's going to strike you. He's going to fix you in it. Like making you a pillar in a temple. You're going to be fixed in it. Then he says that you may dwell in a place of your own. You're going to be able to get beneath the surface and actually put down roots this time. It won't be superficial. And, and be disturbed no more. Neither will the sons of wickedness oppress them as they did at the beginning. So in other words... All them wicked voices and all them people talk about what you can't do and all the people that walk by sight are going to get away from you. Or you may have to get them away from you, but they're not going to oppress you anymore. You're not going to be in an environment of wickedness where people are always trying to put you down and hold you back and limit your potential. Because God is about realizing potential. God is about helping you become everything that he created you to be. And you can only do that in this kind of environment. How do I know that's true? Can I prove that by life? Yes, I can. Because that's the only way plants grow. Plants don't grow any other way than, number one, if they're in the right place, which has to do with good soil and prepared, tilled ground. Because you can't plant in dry ground or you can't plant in nutrient-poor, crusty brown, chalky soil. You can't plant any seeds like that. Nothing will take root. You have to have deep black, black like my shirt, discolored black, deep black fertile rich soil that you plant the seed in and then you have to give it some time and then the seed will not only spring up, but it springs down and it puts forth roots and then when that, that plant springs up, it's got to be nurtured. Okay, that takes time. It takes a lot of sunlight. It takes rain. It takes water. Okay? And then you have to put down some fertilizer to make sure that it gets what it needs uh, uh, more from the ground. And then you also have to have some type of something to keep the bugs away. Because just like the bugs and the pests want to come and try to eat up the plant, so do wicked people come and the devil comes to try to eat up your faith, to try to eat up your harvest. And God said, they're not going to press you anymore. You see what I mean? It's just like that. That's what the Holy Ghost is telling us that we're going. 
So those of you that are in step and in sync, in sync with the Spirit, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Because the next move of God in your life. See, I'm just getting relaxed just thinking about it. I'm just, I'm just literally, as I'm talking to you, I just feel myself relaxing. I feel a sense of peace coming as I'm talking. Because God is saying, get ready to get planted. Get ready to be in a place that I provided for you. You're not going to have to move no more. And you're going to be able to put down roots and all them little bugs and all them pests and all them wicked people and all that unbelief and all that oppression and all that noise. Because one thing about demons and one thing about wicked people is that they loud. You ever notice that? You ever notice that when you're doing deliverance, you're casting demons out of people, they scream. You ever notice when people want attention, they scream. You ever notice when, when things are out of control, it's noise. It's always all this noise. You ever notice that? But even as I'm talking, I'm feeling a sense of peace with all that's going to move away. And you're going to have a, finally a place of peace where you can prosper and flourish and stretch down to establish roots and stretch up to bear fruit. Ooh, Lord, I'm excited. I'm excited, I'm excited, I'm excited. All right. <clears throat> Next portion of the program, I always go in the spirit and ask the Holy Ghost, is there physical healing that needs to manifest? Are there demons that need to be cast out? Does anybody need deliverance? Um, is there another prophetic word he wants me to release? And are there any financial words? So right now, put your prayer request on the screen. If there's anything you want me to pray for, put your prayer request on the screen right now. Um, now remember, I can't always see everything that's scrolling. So if I don't pray for it during the broadcast, just leave it up there and I will pray for it after I get through broadcasting because I might not see it. So if you got any prayer requests, put them on the screen for me now. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm going to ask the Holy Ghost if there's anything else to do. God is saying somebody's having problems in their knees. Put your hands on your knees and say, in the name of Jesus, I speak life to my knees. I speak life to every bone, every joint, every ligament, every muscle, every tendon. And by his stripes, I am healed. I speak life to my knees. I command my knees to be 100% whole, uh, down to my bone marrow. I command my knees to be able to hold up the weight of my body without a problem. Speak life to my knees and no more pain. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke the devil. We do not receive any kind of breaking down of our body, and we command our knees to be 100% whole. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray it, we believe it, and we decree it. Amen. Amen. Okay, somebody's got some soreness in their mouth. Put your hand on your mouth and say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command my mouth to be 100% whole. No more brokenness, no, no more disjointedness, no more pain in my mouth. But in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke this pain. I rebuke the devil. I do not receive your pain, devil. But I command my mouth, my jaw, my teeth, my tongue, my lips, my gums, the roof of my mouth, everything in my mouth to be lined up. My jaw, the hinge of my jaw, on my jawbone. I command everything, all of my teeth. I command everything to be lined up, to be perfectly aligned, to be healed and whole and 100% well and right in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We pray it, we believe it, we decree it, and it is so. Because by his stripes I am healed. Amen. Amen and amen. All right, here's a financial word. The Holy Ghost is saying, God is saying, I see you when you're sowing. There's sometimes that you believe because you've sown in secret and because you've sown the way I've, I've uh, told you to sow, that it's not seen. But every time you have sown in secret, I have prepared a reward and I'm going to reward you openly. So prepare for your open reward for all that you have sown all that you have given, all that you have planted in my name is going to come to fruition, but I'm going to reward you in front of people, that which you have sown in secret and in private. I'm going to bless you and reward you openly, says the Spirit of the living God. 
Amen on that financial blessing. Amen and amen. And finally, I cast out the spirit of unbelief. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I curse unbelief. Spirit of unbelief, you found an unclean spirit that's trying to attach on to somebody like a like a crab, like a like a, like a cancer, like like a multi tentacle beast, beast, like an octopus. I see you in the spirit, and I curse you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of the true and living God. You can't attach to me, and you can't attach to anybody that's listening to this broadcast, and you can't attach to anyone that believes that calls on the name of Jesus. We cast out unbelief. We cast out doubt. We cast out disbelief, and we're not going to have that crab and that cancer and that octopus attached to us, but we're going to walk that faith. And we're going to make our confession. We're going to stand on the word of God. We do not accept you. We do not receive you. You have no place in our lives. So in the name of Jesus, that crab spirit, that octopus spirit, I cast you out in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Break off of the people of God and you can't stay in the area. You have to leave in the name of Jesus Christ, the son of the true and the living God. I decree it. I demand it. And it is so. Amen and amen. Well, amen. <laughs> I'm blessed by all that. Amen and amen. I'm, I'm blessed by that. I'm encouraged by that. And so I'm looking forward to all that, what the scriptures say, and all that, what the Holy Ghost say. I'm looking forward to all that. So, amen, amen. So we're coming to the end of August. Remember I told you a couple weeks ago, get all your work done for August. August is up in a week. Can you believe it? Can you believe that August is gone and September will be here in a week? So make sure you get all your work done for August because when September hits, there's going to be new instructions, new commandments, new uh, marching orders, new edicts from the Lord. There's going to be a shift in the spirit and God's going to tell us something new as we swing into the fall season. So be sure you get your August work done this week so that when the Lord speaks, we'll be ready to go. Okay. Amen. God bless you. I am on every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, every Sunday. And then I'm on once a month on Thursday night, the second Thursday of every month. I'm on at 7 p.m. dealing with a series called No More Genies, where we get rid of our genie concept of God, where we throw out all those wrong things about God that we believe and that we've been taught with bad religious teaching. And we actually look at what the word actually says so we can actually have right faith according to the rightly divided word of truth. So that's every second Thursday, 7 p.m. I'm on Facebook, Periscope, and then the replays on YouTube. And then I'm on every Sunday at this time, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, on Facebook Live, Periscope, and then the replays on YouTube, okay? Um, and if you want to sow into my ministry, I have a cash app in Excel, so I put those links on my Facebook Live and underneath the video on YouTube if you uh, want to bless my ministry, okay? financially. All right. God bless you. I love you with the love of Christ. I'm excited about what the Lord is doing. I feel fortunate uh, to, I want to be in step. I want to stay in step with the spirit. And it's an honor to be used by God in the prophetic because God does not need me for anything, but he gave me an opportunity to serve him and be a part of his kingdom. And I'm grateful for it every day of my life. And I trust that you are too. Amen. And God bless. And I'll see you next week, September. <laughs> I'll see you next week and next time. Amen.